we're going to have a look at now is the doctor in the sky. He's called Sunshine. Slip, slop, slap is not working. Did you know that? It's not working. Sun cancer rates have not declined since slip, slop, slap has brought in. In fact, something's risen and it's risen to a rate that has never been known in Australia. It's called vitamin D deficiency. You see, when the ultraviolet rays from the sun hit the skin, they convert a form of cholesterol just under the skin to vitamin D. Now, did you notice what this, this is converted to vitamin D? Cholesterol. You can have someone with vitamin D deficiency because they're on cholesterol-lowering medication. So when the sun's rays hit the skin, they convert a form of cholesterol just under the skin to vitamin D. It takes two hours for the conversion to happen. So if someone goes into a shower and washes themselves with soap straight after their exposure to sun, they will get no vitamin D. You have to wait two hours. You can lay in the sun, dive in the creek, and you won't lose it because you're not scrubbing your oil off. Vitamin D is being hailed today as the anti-cancer vitamin. Research is showing that vitamin D can stop cancer cells developing and even reverse them. Now when you consider what we looked at on Monday, the link between cancer and fungus, what does sun do to fungus? Annihilates it, totally annihilates it. Vitamin D is essential for the assimilation of calcium in the body. And calcium's got a nickname. It's called the king. Because when calcium gets into the body, all the other minerals piggyback on the back. If you can get calcium in, you can get all the other minerals in. And the gardener knows it. When the gardener increases the calcium in his soil, he increases all the other minerals automatically in the soil. And calcium is essential for the strong bones. And we've got an epidemic in Australia today, another epidemic, it's called osteoporosis. Yeah, Osteoporosis, in a land of many people on cholesterol-lowering medications, not having sun exposure, not getting vitamin D, not able to get their calcium, the bones are starting to weaken and dentists are making a fortune on people's mouths. Yeah? How much does a filling cost today? Would it be $200? And the rest? I know one lady, she went and just had a, they had a look at her teeth, no cavities, so they said, oh, we'll give it a clean while you're here, and she said, oh, all right. $158. Whew, it's, we'll look after these teeth. <laughs> That's where your oil pulling is such a fantastic, easy, cheap way to keep that microbial community in your mouth at the right balance because when the community gets out of balance and the harmful microbes increase they're the ones that actually can eat away at the enamel but we've got to strengthen these bones too by making sure we're getting adequate vitamin D the good news is you only need 15 minutes on your face a day to get all the vitamin D that you need for that day but there are days where there's not a lot of sun so my suggestion is you have a little bit more Something interesting about vitamin D is not only do you need to not have washed your skin with soap for two hours before or two hours after to get your vitamin D, but you also need to make sure you're having that exposure. If you're in the sun for half an hour, your body stops making vitamin D and it can have a negative effect on the body being able to make vitamin D. Whoa. So overexposure and underexposure to the sun can both cause vitamin D deficiencies. And we're if the sun, in the sun for half an hour, we usually get burnt, don't we? And if we get burnt, what's the body saying? Don't, don't stay out in it for that long. My suggestion is you do 10 minutes front, 10 minutes back, maybe a couple of times a day. And if you do that, after several days, you will start to see a lovely tanned colour come on your skin. Little by little by little, the body develops a tan, and that's the best protection against sun cancer. You've seen on the side of the road, there's a great big picture of a lady lying in the sun with a bikini on, and it says, skin cells in trauma. I'd love to get up there with a paintbrush and write, if she's dehydrated, 
if she had margarine for breakfast, because it comes out as a toxic, a toxic fat on the skin and reacts with the sun and can cause damage in the skin, if she's a coffee drinker, if she's been there more than 15 minutes, see all the ifs? That's the only time they would be in trauma. But if she's well hydrated, had a nourishing breakfast, she's only been out there for 15 minutes, they're not in trauma. They're actually receiving healing. Your bones and your teeth need the calcium to make them strong and they can only access the calcium if vitamin D is present. Your eyes need sun. We have a book in the bookcase called Better Eyesight Without Glasses by Dr William Bates. Dr William Bates nearly lost his credentials over writing this book. And he shows how you can strengthen your eyes. He says in that book that strain strengthens your eyesight. The only time strain doesn't strengthen your eyesight is if you're tired. And how many people are straining their eyes late at night when they should be asleep? You know how often parents say, you, you'll hurt your eyes reading in that light early in the morning. No, it strengthens the eyes. It's only when the eyes are pushed to their limit when the body needs to rest. Do you know why? Because your eyes are an extension of your brain. And when your brain's tired, your eyes are tired. It's like whipping a tired horse further, further. And the poor old horse gets to the stage when you go to get it for work and it won't even get up. And that's what's happening with eyes. As soon as a person's eyes deteriorate, when they start wearing glasses, the, the eyes now get lazy and get weaker and weaker. How can you strengthen your eyes? Strengthen your eyes by giving them rest. Strengthen your eyes by allowing them to experience the sun. Remember, your eyes are an extension of your brain and your brain needs sun and it gets the sun through the eyes. And different sun rays give different messages to the eyes. That's why if you wear glasses, make sure there's times in the day where you don't have your glasses so the ultraviolet rays can give their messages through. Never do I suggest that you look at the sun. Your eyes will tell you not to do that. It's only in the last 10 years scientists have discovered there's a receptor site on the eye called melanopsin and it's not involved with sight. Melanopsin absorbs blue light and they found when adequate levels of blue light are happening, tactical reasoning increases, mathematical, the ability to solve mathematical problems increases and the light with the most blue light is the sunlight. So our brain needs the sunlight messages. Light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve to a control centre in the brain where your body clock is located. And your body clock communicates with the pineal gland. The pineal gland releases serotonin. That's why you feel so good on a sunny day. The pineal gland also helps you to sleep better. The pineal gland, it also interferes with many, many functions in the brain. And of course, we need to have it stimulated by the sunshine. Another aspect of eye connected with sun or eye exposed to sun, and Dr. Neil Nedley brings this out, he shows that about 80% of people who are depressed, their circadian rhythm is out. And to reset the circadian rhythm, allow your eyes to experience the first hour of light in a day. That early morning light absorbed through the eyes has an effect on the brain to reset the circadian rhythm. And how many people in society today are watching the box till midnight and they miss that first hour of light in a day? Is that a big contributing factor to the 45% of Australians that are suffering from mental illness? If you're a night owl, a beautiful way to reset your circadian rhythm is to allow your eyes to experience sunrise and sunset because that gives very clear, defined messages to the brain. And didn't God make it easy? What a beautiful picture <laughs> is painted in the sky at sunrise and sunset. And our eyes need exposure to that. Dr. William Bates says, even in the middle of a hot sunny day, go outside, close your eyes and look up with your eyelids closed and then put your head down and then open your eyes. So you're actually getting some through the skin. He also says to raise your eyelid, look down and let the sun's rays touch the whites of your eyes, obviously only for a few minutes. 
it will increase circulation to the eyeball and increase eyesight. One of the problems with eyes today is too much exposure of the eyes to just screens. A friend of mine went to a really old optometrist. He's probably dead now because this was years ago. And she said, my eyes are failing. And he said, I know why. He said, you've got too much time at the screen. And I loved what he said. He said, we need to spend more time gazing at the mountains, the vastness of nature, rather than our eyes going to these little boxes. And he said, one way to get those muscles working well, because the muscles that you use in looking at the screen all pull in and too much is happening there. So he said, very gently, you just squeeze your eyelid, your eyebrows like this. Not harsh, very gently, because they're very delicate little muscles. And he said, that's all you really need to do. So these are little things you can do to make sure those eyes are working well, to make sure your eyesight is working well, and to make sure your brain is getting sun. Because your brain needs sun, and it gets sun through the eyes. We need to look at the doctor in the sky a little bit differently. Your body loves exposure to sun. Any part of your body that's not working well, put it in the sun. Put as much of the body in the sun as you dare. If your skin is very light, just start with a few minutes at a time. If it's nice and olive, you certainly can endure more. And the fact is that dark-skinned people need twice the sun exposure as light-skinned people. So when you do lay in the sun, make sure you've had no caffeines. Make sure you're well hydrated. Make sure you had a nourishing breakfast and don't lay out there for too long. Rest. Let's have a look at rest. There's a tiny little gland in the base of your brain called the pineal gland. In my 1970s anatomy and physiology book, it says there that not much is known about the pineal gland. Well, we know a lot about the pineal gland today. The pineal gland is a very important brain, sorry, part of the brain, gland in the brain, because it is responsible for releasing rest and rejuvenate hormones in the night. And the pineal gland will only release these hormones between the hours at the moment of 10 p.m. and 3 a.m., in the winter, and I think we've only got a few more weeks till daylight saving stops, then it will be 9 p.m. and 2 a.m. That's, that's your winter times because the pineal gland doesn't know about daylight saving. Light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve to a control centre in the brain where your body clock is located and your body clock communicates with the pineal gland. So we've got dark happening. I think, I think dark's happening about 7 p.m., would I be right, at the moment? And we've got light happening about 6.15. So it's in these hours that your, are your hours of power. I call them the hours of power because it's in these hours that the pineal gland releases the hormones. Let's have a look at the hormones. One is serotonin. And serotonin is your mood hormone. What are the children like if they have a late night? They're no good, are they? That's because they didn't get their serotonin and the parents aren't much better. I had a girlfriend who used to go to bed at midnight every night and her children used to wake in the morning, tiptoe around the kitchen, grab a quick breakfast and try and get out of the house before she woke up because she used to bite their heads off. She had no serotonin happening. Not a nice way. The kids grow up so quickly, don't they? <laughs> you want them to have nice memories of home. If you want to feel great every day, all day, go to bed early and get those hours where you'll get your mood hormone. Number two is arginine vasitocin. Arginine vasitocin is a hormone... that is your natural painkiller. If you are suffering from any type of pain, go to bed early and your natural painkiller will kick in. But it's very important, and I'll make a list here of things you can do to increase the output of these hormones. If you do one hour's exercise a day, 
that can double the output of these hormones at night. And it's very important for your natural painkiller because your natural painkiller, when it's used by the body, it gives off a waste. And if you exercise the next day, you release the waste. If you don't release the waste, then that next night you won't release the arginine vasotocin. I know a few friends who are managing back pain by exercising every day, which ensures not only that their muscles and their tendons and their ligaments are strengthened to compensate for the injury they have, but it also causes a release of the waste from using their natural painkiller, which means every night their natural painkiller can kick in again. Arginine vasotocin also puts a person into a deep sleep. I know many people who can't sleep, so they go to bed later thinking that they'll get tighter, but the opposite's true. The earlier you go to sleep, the more likely you are to fall into a deep sleep. I had one lady come to me and she said, she said, oh, it drives me crazy. I wake up at 3 o'clock every morning. It just drives me crazy. When I was, uh, oh, it must have been about a year ago, Time magazine did a whole article on sleep. And I was reading it, and it said in there, sleeping tablets don't really do much because they're not fixing the problem and the person doesn't feel great. They're actually showing now that a lot of sleeping tablets are causing other problems. They said there's one thing that helps, and that is cognitive brain therapy, cognitive behavioural therapy. Let me explain, and I'll explain it by using this lady. When this lady heard this lecture and realised that she was getting her hours of power, I said, all you have to do now is when you wake up in the night, at three o'clock, instead of going, oh no, what am I going to do? Why does this happen? When you wake up at three now, you can say, this is fantastic. I've got my hours of power, I'll just doze, I'll just plan my day. That's cognitive behaviour therapy. She just changed the way that she looked at it. And because she changed the way that she looked at it, she actually started to doze back to sleep. It wasn't a deep sleep. But then if you understand your sleeping patterns, you don't have your deep sleep there. You have your deep sleeps here. That's the sleep that's powerful. Number three is epithalamin. Epithalamin is a hormone that slows down ageing. Everybody over the age of 25 likes that one. <laughs> so if you want to slow down ageing, go to bed early. I was reading about a 116 Russian man and they were interviewing him as to the secrets of his longevity. And he had a couple of points. He said, I rise with the sun, I go down with the sun. And the other one was, he said, I hold anger with no man. <laughs> Very important. We'll look at that on Saturday. What's the old saying? Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy and wise. When that saying was said or made, they didn't know about the pineal gland. It was just observation. Epithalamin not only slows down ageing, but it increases learning capacity. We should never be out of school and we should never stop learning. And on Saturday morning, when I look at how you can make your brain younger with age, you will realise you can never stop learning. If you stop learning, you basically brain cells start to die. We should never stop learning. So one way to increase our learning capacity is to make sure we get these hours of power. Number four is melatonin. And melatonin is your fix and rejuvenate nighttime hormone. So basically when you sleep in those hours, your batteries are fully charged. Many people wake with a groan in the morning, unable to get out of bed or even function without their cup of coffee because they just go to bed too late and they miss out on their hours of power. This is especially important for people who are wanting healing to happen in their body because this is when the healing powers of the body are the most effective, are the most vibrant, are the most powerful. So these hours of power must be adhered to so that you get more out of your life, more out of your day. 
They also very important to adhere to be adhered for for mental health, for healing in the body. Let's have a look at how you can decrease and how you can increase the output of these hormones. You'll like this one, laughter. The old proverb says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. My daughter gave me this one. She, she found it somewhere, a quote. It said, Against the on, onslaught of laughter, nothing can stand. We should laugh more. And on the other hand, worry. The old saying says, worry is blind and cannot discern the future. doesn't change anything, does it? If you can't sleep because you're worried about something, get up and write a solution. Write a letter or put it down on paper and then go back to bed and sleep. <laughs> what can also increase the output of these hormones at night is sunshine through the day. Not only sunshine through the day, but sleeping in the dark. Because remember my initial statement was that light and dark signals are fed through the optic nerve. So when we give it a very clear, clear messages of sunny day, dark night, the pineal gland gets nice clear messages. So sleeping in the dark is very important. If someone leaves, needs a bit of light in the night, I suggest getting one of those little night lights that you can plug into the PowerPoint that will not interfere with the pineal gland. It's like moonlight. So you want about the light of the moonlight. So sleeping in the dark does it. Also fasting. Because when you fast and there's very little activity in your gastrointestinal tract, especially in your colon, tryptophan is made. And tryptophan is a key amino acid used in the production of melatonin and serotonin. That's why you sleep so much better when you go to bed with an empty tummy. <laughs> Let's have a look at what decreases it. Not only worry, but artificial lights. And I'm referring to the screens. So we've got our iPhones, the iPods, computers, televisions. They're very handy tools and we all use them and have them. But the most dangerous time to use them is in your hours of power. That's the dangerous time to use them. That's one of the biggest contributing factors to mental illness today is the brain is not being recharged when it should be, but not only not being recharged, it's getting overstimulated from the flashing lights of the screen. That really causes deterioration of brain. See, our brain should not deteriorate. The day before we die, we should be the smartest, the wisest and the brightest of our whole life. But that's not happening, is it? <laughs> It's not happening in this society. There are many societies where it is happening. Look at the Hunzas in the Himalayan mountains. They're not considered wise enough to hold positions of responsibility till they're 70. <laughs> Whoa. They play volleyball and the under 50s play the over 50s and they often tie. So I'm not saying get rid of them because we need them. That's unrealistic and they're very, very handy. Instead of taking two or three bags of books to the Bronx when I teach, I just take a little computer and it's all in there. <laughs> very, very handy. But just make sure that computer is shut off by 9.30 in the summer, by 8.30 in the winter. But I've got an assignment to do. Okay, we'll get up at 4. Four years ago, I had one week to do a 10,000 word thesis for my nutrition course. I did it in one week. When did I do it? I went to bed at eight and I got up at four and I had two hours of peak study time. And when I read my thesis today, I go, oh, who wrote that? That's very well said. <laughs> <laughs> That's when the brain is sparky. So I say to parents, you, you've got a monitor this in your home with your, with your teenagers because I think it's a huge problem today. Many kids are taking their iPhones to bed under the bed covers watching videos, SMSing friends. You know what my, my sister does? Father says, 
Phones, please. I'll charge them in my office overnight. It's a good idea. <laughs> so that those hours of power, the brain and the eyes, are being able to get their rest and rejuvenation. Coffee. Or caffeine as a whole, it cuts it in half for six hours. Alcohol. Alcohol, 41% reduction in the output of those hormones. So if a person has some red wine before they go to bed, it might put them to sleep, but they will wake with half-charged batteries. It's not worth it. Well, why does the doctor advise it? Because he does it. But the research shows it's, it does not work. Meat. Meat is very high in an amino acid called methionine. And methionine, when its levels are high, it blocks the action of tryptophan. That's why Colin Campbell, he showed in his book, a 5% animal protein diet is not dangerous, but a 20% animal protein diet is, and in many ways, and this is another way where it is. Having this information, you can get more out of your day, more out of your life. When I married Michael, he used to do a lot of his work at night because he had two little children and he said, no one rings me at midnight. Well, he's discovered no one rings you at five o'clock in the morning either. And we've been married for 14 years and for the first few years, about once a week, he'd say to me, I've got to do it. I've got to get into that office. i just got to get on top of everything. He never does it now. But a couple of times I've seen him, he said, sorry, can't walk this morning, I've got to get over in that office and put an hour in. <laughs> you see, what do you remember at midnight when you're falling asleep? You don't even remember it, do you? You're far better to go to sleep and then get up early. Because remember, they're your hours of power. And if you get those hours, your batteries are recharged. Before we move on from rest, there's one other part of the body that I'd like to look at that rarely gets a rest. It is stomach. We have one stomach. Just to remind you of that fact, I'll put a big number one there. Because the way many people treat their stomachs, I don't think they realise they've got one stomach. Cows, sheep, Goats, they can eat all day because they've got five, maybe four, maybe three stomachs and it just goes from one to the other. We've only got one. I read a book recently, I mentioned it early, earlier, it's uh, The Physiology of Digestion by Dr. William Beaumont. He wrote it in 1833 and a friend of mine found it on Amazon. They found it in a library in the southern states of America and they charged me 20 cents for this old book. It's in the bookshelf there. I paid $20 by the time it got to me. But it's a fascinating story. I had heard of it, and I've heard it referred to, but I finally got the book. It was in the late 1700s, and Alexis St. Martin, a young 18-year-old man, he sustained a gunshot wound to his stomach. Dr. William Beaumont was only 25 at the time, and he was called to assess the man. And he said the man would not live long. Part of his stomach had been blown away, part of his ribs had been smashed, but the young man actually began to heal. So Dr. Beaumont took him to his home where he could tend him. What was very interesting, I found it very interesting, is about once a week a big tumour would rise up and then it would burst and a two-inch piece of rib came out. That happened five times. Notice why the body made a tumour, to get rid of a piece of rib. Now this is before antibiotics and what Dr. Beaumont would do, he would put aloe, aloe vera, he would put myrrh, wouldn't it be great if doctors did that today? I know some doctors to do, but not many do. But Alexis St. Martin finally totally healed except for one thing, there was a, a little hole in his stomach. 
and it was like a mouth. It never actually sealed. And in the book, there's a little pencil drawing of it. So what Dr. Beaumont did, he started to do some experiments. He would get a piece of silk thread, he would put a piece of food on it, and he would put it down into the stomach. And after an hour, he'd pull it out and look at it, put it back in, pull it out. And he did this over many years. Did you know that Alexis St. Martin lived till he was about 80? He married, had children. Every now and then, Dr. Beaumont would contact him and say, please come and stay with me for a, a year. I'd like to do a few more experiments. I'll put your children through school. I'll give you a nice house. <laughs> Dr. Beaumont found that digestion took, on an average, of three to four hours. That's how long digestion took. And of course, in America, at the time, People ate breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. It's only a recent phenomenon that people are eating their main meal at the end of the day. I was talking to Henry this morning, who grew up in Malaysia. He said, oh, we always had our main meal at breakfast. It's just a recent phenomenon. And it makes no sense. Our day is a journey. Who'd fuel up their car at the end of a journey? But isn't that what most Aussies are doing? Dr. Beaumont found that digestion took, on an average, three to four hours. The stomach loves a one-hour rest. And in that one-hour rest, all the digestive juices can be replaced. We should be eating breakfast like a king. We should be eating lunch like a queen. We should be eating tea like a pauper. The only way you can do that with five hours between the meals is to make sure that you're having high fibre in the diet, to make sure that you're having substantial protein. Remember, these are the three essentials. We looked at these the other day. And sufficient fats. Most people have insufficient fats. Because these are the three foods that keep the food in the stomach longer. And the reason so many people are eating every couple of hours is they're eating high, usually refined carbohydrate, and the brain says, there's nothing in there for me, give me something else. Give me something else. And that's why I found this book so fascinating. Because he proved this, that we should be eating breakfast like a queen, like queen, sorry, lunch like a queen, and tea like a pauper. But surely not the children. Well, I did. And I see a smile from Del, who's got six children, and I'm sure you find that too. Oh, sorry, five children, sorry. Yeah. I stayed with my daughter in Tassie recently and she went away and I for a cup for a little bit and I minded the little girls, three and six, and sorry, three and five they were. The cherries were on. For breakfast we had cherries, then we had sourdough whole grain toast with olive oil, avocado and savoury lentils on top and some nuts and seeds. I didn't hear from those little girls for five hours. I gave them a meal that was high in fibre. Everything had fibre. Good amounts of protein in the legumes, in the nuts, great amounts of fat in the olive oil, in the lentils and the avocado, on the toast and the few nuts. If I'd given them two wheat bix, they would have been wanting something at about 10 in the morning. So to be able to have this rest, we need to be eating like this and our food should contain this. What was interesting is that in his experiments, Dr. Beaumont found that there were some things that caused the food to be still in the stomach eight hours later. Overeating. It was Dr. Beaumont that made the statement after he noticed this. He said, it's not quality of food that is of the most important, it's quantity. Now we know quality is important. But he went to the point of saying, I think quantity is even more important. 
You can be eating beautiful food, but if you overdo it, overburden your stomach, it can turn to poison. It can start to ferment and rot. He also found that if Alexis St. Martin ate often, so often eating, in other words, eating every few hours, if he had something two hours after breakfast and then another two hours, at the end of the day, the food was still in the stomach. You see, this pyloric sphincter's got sensors on it. And he found the food goes round and round and round and stops. And when it stops, the sensors go out. No, nah, it's not broken down properly yet. Round and round and round and stops. Ah, yeah, we can start to take a few things. And then a biscuit comes in mid-morning. Round and round and stops. Pyloric sphincter says, oh, there's something new in there. It's not broken down. So it will not open until the food's broken down to a certain state. And that is why the food can still be in the stomach eight hours later. I remember when I had my first little girl, Emma, and she was about 14 months old. If she got a little bit whingy or cry, I'd give her a little bowl of sultanas and she'd be happy for a while. And then an hour later, she'd be a bit whingy. I'd give her half an apple and she'd be happy while she's eating it, but then she'd be whingy again. And then I read a book that talked about the stomach and how we need to have that rest. So if she got a little bit whingy, I'd give her a drink or I'd give her a cuddle or read a book. I wouldn't do the food thing. And I'd make sure that there was more fibre, protein and fat because never should we overeat because that causes other problems. Do you know I found she was a happier child? Many children are irritable because their stomachs are just overworked and they never get a rest. And how many kids say, I'm hungry when they're actually bored? <laughs> Divert them. Tell you what, I'm hungry. A helicopter lands. Oh, the hunger goes out the window. Wow, look, there's a helicopter. It's diversion. And most parents know that. If my husband says to me and we're travelling and we've still got two hours till lunch and he says, I'm hungry, I say, must be one of the body's many cries for water. Here. <laughs> and I give him water. And often a hunger pang between a meal is dehydration. Our body actually needs the water. What also Dr. Beaumont found caused the stomach to hold the food longer was fear and anger. He found that whenever Alexis St. Martin was upset, it seemed that the hydrochloric acid levels stopped. And do you remember what I said about drinking coffee? Tiger on the path, digestion stops because when a adrenaline crisis happens, all the energy goes to the working muscles because you've got to fight or flight. My daughter Julia works in with, well, she manages Stefano Di Pieri's restaurant. She said, Mum, we've stopped coffee after the meal. Wow, in this fancy restaurant. She says, Mum's too heavy. She said, I've bought antique cups and saucers and we serve herb teas after the meal. If someone wants coffee, they'll give them coffee but they don't actually offer coffee if someone asks, they do. And she says, we do it because it's just too heavy, because they do the six... Actually, I was down there last week, they're doing nine courses. Mind you, some of the courses are two mouthfuls. There was a pre-dessert, which was an eggshell that had been washed out, and then they put like a little yellow custard in and a white yoghurt, and it looks like an egg yolk, and there's about three mouthfuls in that. Julia said one day they went to get it and the eggshell was gone. <laughs> God just eaten the whole eggshell. <laughs> but fear and anger, and that can be produced by drinking coffee. And I think we all know that when we're upset, we can't eat, can we? We cannot digest the meal. That's why I liked in one writer, she said, when we sit to dine, we should cast off care and thought, care and anger. That's why at the table, no controversial issues discussed. Should be a happy time. Even if my nine-month-old baby started crying at the table because something went wrong, I would quickly pick the baby up and put the baby into its room in the cot and shut the door. I never even let the baby cry at the table. And you know what the baby quickly learns? If I want to stay at that table, I've got to stop crying. <laughs> it's amazing how quickly a nine-month-old baby will learn that. And when they stop crying, you open the door and say, would you like to try again? <laughs> no. Okay, you can stay. 
What also can happen is large fluid with the meal. Now if someone's thirsty with a meal, by all means have a mouthful. The problem arises when, you know, two glasses of water straight after the meal are drunk right down. What that does is it dilutes the hydrochloric acid. And then the and then what and Dr. Beaumont found this because you see he got a bird's eye view of digestion with this hole. He said it's as if the body, the stomach, has to get rid of that water. So digestion stops, the fluid has to be taken out to bring the pH of the stomach back up to a high pH and then digestion can be resumed again. The last one, number five, was alcohol. Dr Beaumont found that when alcohol was taken with the meal, the digestion slowed right down. He found by observing those little folds, you see it's, they were like little folds that were just at the opening. He said when alcohol was taken, he could see raw bits and even pussy bits on, on those folds. And Alexis St Martin could feel no pain. In other words, the stomach has to bro be broken down fairly badly before the person actually feels it. And this is why I put stomach under the rest law. Our stomach needs a rest between meals. Now even when the stomach's empty, do you know where the food gets absorbed into the blood? Down here, down in the small intestine. So even when the stomach's empty, you're still getting nutrients taken in. And that's why you can go five hours between a meal. And if you're hungry between a meal, have a glass of water. One day my son Peter came to me and said, Mum, the water's not doing it anymore. I looked at my watch and I said, oh good, it's lunchtime. And that's what you find. When the water doesn't take the hunger away anymore, it's usually time to eat. We are bodies that run according to rhythm. And the whole body is a rhythmic body. And your stomach loves it when you eat at the same time every day, when you drink at the same time. It doesn't mean that you have to eat on the dot of seven every single day. You can be quarter to seven one day, or quarter to past or half past another day. What the body doesn't like is five o'clock one day, 10 o'clock another day, eight o'clock another day. And of course the odd time doesn't matter. Sometimes I have to catch an early morning plane and I have a very early breakfast. Remember, it's not the odd day you do it and the odd day you don't. It's what you do every day that has an effect on the human body. So be mindful of the stomach. Stomach's a very important organ because if you're not getting the nourishment out of that stomach, remember, you've got a hollow tube and if it can't break down the food effectively, the food can't even get into your blood to become part of you. And it is in the stomach where specifically the protein is broken down. And we've looked at the importance of protein this week. So it's very important to eat sufficient protein, very important to make sure your stomach's working well so it can break down that protein. So stomach working well is just as important as eating the right protein. So look after stomach. And if the personal trainer says, no, 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 you've got to eat every two hours, what you do is you just prove what works with you. One lady said, I only ever ate breakfast, lunch and tea. And the personal trainer said, I've got to eat every two hours. She said, ever since I've just had bloating and discomfort. You see, if you're having that, it's a sign. Your body's saying something's not working here. And remember what's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and def do different res expect different results. If it's not working, make a few adjustments. Make a few adjustments because the fine tuning is yours. You're the doctor. There is no body like yours. The good news is tomorrow we're going to spend the whole morning on food. Our first lecture tomorrow we're going to look at the acid alkaline balance, how to keep that balance in the body and the second part of the lecture we're going to have a look at fats. I call the lecture Fantastic Fats. Thank you for your attention this morning.